This episode is brought to you by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Go to aaomc.org and join us. Join the war against the myopia epidemic. All right, welcome back to the Corrective View podcast. This is a show about orthokeratology. This is a show about myopia control, specialty care, and sometimes it's a podcast about things that are adjacent to myopia control and orthokeratology. And we have an episode for you today that is very adjacent. I don't know if you recognize the gentleman on the screen named Matthew Martin. If I had my way, this guy would be my co-host on every episode of the Corrective View podcast. But I'll get him when I can get him, and here he is. And he is bringing a special topic to us about building future doctors. Matthew Martin, welcome to the podcast. I am really excited and honored to be here, Matt. This is something that I had been wanting to share with the ortho K community, with the myopia control community, and really with the entirety of every doctor in our profession. So many times I run into situations today where people say that doctors aren't enthusiastic about eye care and they're not enthusiastic about the younger generation. So you have a lot of doctors who are, I don't want to say bitter, but maybe not as enthusiastic. And so one of the things that we wanted to do within the bounds of our office is share my enthusiasm and the staff's enthusiasm for eye care and more specifically for myopia control within the context of eye care. So one of the things that we did early on in the practice is we were searching around for staff members to help out in some positions in our office. And we were approached by the work-based learning um, director of the local school system. And a lot of doctors out there are like, hold on, I'm not sure what work-based learning is. And we're gonna talk about that really quite in depth today. We're gonna discuss work-based learning. We're gonna discuss why every office in the nation should have work-based learning students in it and why having work-based learning students in it is gold for you. It's gold for the practice. It's amazing for the community. It's just really a win across the board, okay? Fantastic. Why don't you go around and introduce the amazing guests that you've brought here for us, uh, starting with Ashley Peters. Excellent. So Ashley Peters is one of our former co-ops, and she came into the office, joined our staff, became an integral part of our technician program and our myopia control program in the office. She then transferred her enthusiasm for that into wanting to be an eye doctor, and she is now in her second year of graduate school, which is pretty amazing. We're exceptionally proud of Ashley. All right, Ashley, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, everybody. And then Next, let's talk, Joshua. Yeah, let's talk for a moment about uh, Dr. Joshua Rabidou. Dr. Joshua Rabidou um, was one of our first co-ops, not the first, but within the first couple of years of our co-op program here at the office. And what's great about uh, Dr. Rabidou is that when he first came to us, I'm going to be a little bit revealing here, he was a little shy, he was a little awkward, and uh, he joined our practice and he just blossomed and became this amazing staff member. He was one of my first myopia control coordinators in the office. So he was quarterbacking myopia control cases. He was handling ortho K in the office. He then went ahead and went to graduate school and has just graduated this past May as a doctor. And uh, he's going to be an amazing doctor, just truly a special, special uh, technician, a special employee, a special team member, and now just really an amazing doctor. Awesome. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Beth. Yeah, so Beth Jahoski's role is pretty great. She is our work-based coordinator, so meaning that she is the liaison between us and the school system. So she cherry picks for me the best candidates so that I know that I'm getting candidates who are going to be enthusiastic, who are going to be going into a STEM field, whether it's uh, optometry or nursing, veterinarian. You know, we've had just a wide variety, engineers, all kinds of stuff who come through our office. And she helps to pick out who's gonna be enthusiastic, who's got a good personality, and who she thinks is gonna be a good fit for us. Great, Joshua and Beth, welcome to the program. Excited to be here. Oh, glad and excited to be here as well. 
Awesome. So Dr. Martin, why don't you start us off with what is a work-based program? I mean, I went to art school. I'm not an optometrist, so I have no idea of what we're talking about for this episode. So let's give the preliminaries, the basics for somebody like me. Yeah. So let me start out by kind of giving you a little bit of backstory. So when I purchased the practice, um, we had a mix of employees here at the office. And if you can believe it, going back all those years, I was actually doing all of the pre-work myself. So a patient would come in, I'd pick them up at the front, you know, I would do all the pre-work for them, I would do the interview, all the grunt work, including the exam. And it was just a, a slow process. So we needed some technicians in the office. So when we started looking around for technicians, we originally had hired um, a couple of full-time technicians and they were they were good, but they sometimes lacked the enthusiasm that I wanted for our office. We have a, a very upbeat, very um, dynamic office and we had some employees who were, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, they were just punching a clock and uh, we were looking for somebody who would be a better fit. The work-based learning coordinator um, at the time, which wasn't Beth, she since replaced that person, um, had approached us and said, are you interested in hiring a high school student to come and work at your office in order to do that technician job? And at first I was like, no, no thanks. I wanna hire a, a more mature individual or I wanna hire someone maybe who's gonna have um, more of an open schedule for what we needed. And the co-op coordinator at that time uh, or the work-based learning coordinator at that time said, why don't you interview a couple of them and see what you think? So it, we were fortunate, they sent over about 10 students. We interviewed 10 students and we had two really great candidates. I ended up picking up our first candidate um, whose name was Katie and she joined the office and holy cow, did she do a good job. She was enthusiastic. She was happy to be there. She would come after school jump right in on patients. We taught her to do all the things that we wanted her to do technician wise, meaning at that time it was kind of a simpler process. This is going back nearly nearly 19 years now. So, you know, we weren't as sophisticated as we are now. Um, and it just, it was wonderful. And so it was good for the community because we were taking a student. Um, it was good for us because we, we had someone who was enthusiastic about being here in the office. So what the work-based learning program is, is it's a program where high school students can come and work in an office. Um, oftentimes it's a profession they wanna go into, right? I wanna go into eye care. Um, maybe I wanna be a veterinarian. You know, maybe I wanna be a nurse, whatever. So they can come and work in your office and do a job that you assign them to do. They get real life work experience. And more importantly, they get to see what it's like to be in that position. So for instance, uh, Joshua, when he joined us, and I'll let him, I'm kind of stepping on his story a bit, but Josh will talk about this later, I hope. He didn't think he wanted to be an eye doctor, you know, and now, He's a fantastic eye doctor and he's excited about his career. I mean, that's 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 taking somebody who maybe was gonna be wasted um, in, in a job that they weren't crazy about and showing them the potential for something that's gonna be really great for them. Um, and what's what's really great about it is you, you can get these students who are maybe a blank slate and give them the opportunity to see the cool things that we do and to grow and, and experience the opportunities there. So the benefit to the practice is that you're getting somebody who is bright eyed, excited, passionate, and you can mold them into a future career for them, or at least give them, you know, a, a beneficial experience. And then in return, you get this extremely motivated individual uh, who just adds to your practices. Is, is that the gist of it? That is really the gist of it. And I think the magic and the reason I really wanted to bring this to the attention of other doctors out there is again, I hear other doctors saying, we don't run into students who want to go into eye care, or maybe they have a hard time finding partners out there in the real world. This is an opportunity for doctors to work with students who maybe want to go into optometry, or maybe didn't know they wanted to go into optometry. And you're kind of seeding the system. You have to be thinking ahead. But to me, it's very much like myopia control. When we talk about myopia control, we are, every time we see a patient, we're planting the seeds for that patient to have a happier life, to have less myopia, 
to have a better situation, right? And when we see kids, sometimes we'll see a child and we're like, you know, your kid's not really very nearsighted quite yet. I'm going to watch them closely. You know, it could be a two, three year process to get that person in there. But with, it's kind of the same thing. When you're hiring a work-based learning student, you're really setting up potential future people who may be partners, who might be interested in going into eye care, who maybe come and work at your practice and decide that's something that they want to do. And it opens the door for a lot of opportunities for the practice um, to maybe have a, a partner that wants to join them later on. So from a selfish perspective, it's a good way for doctors to start farming opportunity to have people join them later once they finish their career path. Such a great perspective to have on that because when you think about what the average optometry student is facing right out of school, right? They got student debt, they got, you know, everything they just learned. And if you want to get them into ortho K or myopia control, who knows how much they might have gotten that at school. But if you're able to like, you know, uh, curate that experience for that new person and teach them everything that you know, it's like you are just like handcrafting like a, a future partner, like you said, or a future myopia control specialist or a myopia control coordinator or whatever the case may be. So I love it. Uh, why aren't most, uh, you know, especially in our community, why aren't most doctors doing something similar? Do they just not know about it or? I really think that's the key. And that's why I'm so excited to have Beth on here today, as well as Ashley and Dr. Rabidou, because I'm hoping that other doctors out there will be like, oh my gosh, I've been missing this opportunity. I, on a daily basis, look at Facebook posts from like um, uh, ODs on Facebook, um, doctors in a lot of the forums I'm in, and routinely I hear, I can't, I can't hire somebody. It's impossible to hire a technician right now because no one wants to work. Everybody's getting unemployment. So I go to interview someone and they don't want to come off unemployment because it's just too much work for them, right? Um, there is an entire pot of students. There's an entire group of students who are just jonesing to get into an eye care practice. And it's an untapped resource that other doctors just don't know about. And I'm hoping when Beth talks, she'll have a chance to talk about the fact that there are other Everywhere in the country, there's work-based learning. Am I right? And so hopefully she'll be able to talk about that. Yeah. Work-based learning is all throughout the nation. I think for most people, they might refer to it as a co-op program because it used to be called cooperative learning. And then they changed it to work-based learning. So if you've ever heard of a co-op student, it's basically the same thing as work-based learning. The students do get to actually go to work and get those life skills as part of their school time. And I, I don't want to go into too much on this right now, but we are just so blessed to have Dr. Martin's office. Uh, they are one of our top placements. And yes, it is very competitive. Students want to be there. He provides an amazing experience, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But yeah, it's all throughout the nation. So reach out to your local schools. You can reach out to any uh, career and technical educational um, place or any career center in your area, and you should be able to, to match up with a coordinator. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, Dr. Martin, if there isn't anything else with the introduction, what's uh, what part of the discussion do you want to take this into next? Yeah, I would like to jump into having um, Dr. Rabidou and Ashley Peters talk a little bit about the things that we expect from students in our office, since they've both been technicians here. Um, I think if a doctor's office is going to take on a co-op student or a work-based learning student, I think it's an incredible opportunity for them, but they have to give back, okay? You can't just hire them, have them shuffle papers, or have them just do a job. I think that the students need to do more. So, um, and this is something that can grow. When we first started with our co-ops, we had a very narrow job experience, right? They came in, they did the technician stuff. Um, Joshua and Ashley will talk about the things that we expected out of them. And I think that's something that an office can start out maybe just having a narrow experience, but then over time, I think they have to grow it into something that's that's bigger and bolder and more profitable for the students, but also more profitable for the office. So I'm actually gonna kick that to Joshua and Ashley so they can talk about the things they did at the office and they can talk about the expectations that they had within the bounds of their experience here. 
That's great. First, let's uh, let's start with Dr. Robin Do. Uh, Joshua, how did you get interested in this program? How did you hear about it? And then we'll we'll ask the same question to Ashley. It was actually random. I didn't really ever think about an optometry job or anything in the medical field. It just happened. It worked with my schedule. He hired me somehow. He said, yeah, sure, we'll take him on. Uh, I got hired in, found out how much Dr. Martin loved his job. Every day he came in singing to the office. I was like, man, I want that. Like, that's a wicked job. Like, that's cool. And working with the patients is a riot. I didn't work all day. I just sat there and talked with patients. And I got to help them see. And they were, I was awesome to them. They loved me. So I wanted that. <clears throat> so <laughs> I started going to grad school. It's a riot. I love my job now. And I see like people who are do what I wanted to do initially, and they're miserable. And so I'm just so thankful for like the program, right? I would have had no idea. I would have never even thought about it. So very much by chance, but it worked out extremely well. And very thankful for Dr. Martin in office. So worked out extremely well. Yeah. That's awesome. Ashley, how about yourself? So my experience was a little bit different um, where I actually saw out the position. I knew uh, I had a feeling that I wanted to be an eye doctor. Um, And I was actually a, I've been a patient of Dr. Martin since I was a young kid. And so I saw that passion for his career since a young age. And so when it got time in high school to start thinking about what do you want to do with your future? Where do you want to go after this? Um, I interviewed for a job with the work-based learning program so that I could be in the optometry office, in the optometry field uh, as a high schooler. And all it did from there was solidify uh, my passion for for eye care and the drive that I had to go into optometry. That's awesome. It's 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 so interesting to hear that you know you're patient of Dr. Martin's, and then now you know the journey that you've gone on. So, uh, Dr. Martin, what's the first thing we want to get them talking about? I see on the list here you have treat student workers like adults, and you'll get an adult level performance out of them. Yeah, I think if you just go right down the list, I think they'll they'll be able to like kind of fill stuff in. You know that my problem, Matthew, is that I could talk for like three hours here and then no one else would get a word in edgewise. So I really want them to like take the football a little bit and talk about that. So if you guys will just talk a little bit about um, being treated like an adult here rather than a child, and then um, how that changed your performance and how that changed your expectations of yourself, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, I think we weren't just expected to shuffle paperwork and file paperwork. We were in charge of seeing the patients. We were in charge of calling the patients, making sure that we were responsible. Like we needed to call them if their retainers are in, if something was going on, we were responsible for that. That was our job. And so it wasn't just paperwork. And then like when I'm in grad school now, I see these people that have never called a patient in their life, haven't talked to them. They're nervous about it. It's one less thing I have to worry about. And I can focus on, you know, disease or ortho K or whatever else I want to do. It's just one less thing on my plate. That was a great experience. I think for sure the biggest thing that I took away from the working in the program at the office was the patient care skills that I learned that you can't learn in a classroom, you don't learn in grad school, they just kind of have to come naturally over experience. And so we're starting with our foot already in the door. When we start optometry school, we know how to talk to a patient, we know how the structure of an eye exam goes. And it makes it a little bit easier when you're trying to learn all of those new skills that you already have a foundation in in people skills and being a decent human and and being a better doctor because of it. Um, I think it's really important to be able to talk to your patient as well to communicate effectively and what's going on in their eye care because we do it every day, but they see us once a year or a few times a year for management. So it's important to be able to effectively communicate and getting that experience at such a young age is really helpful in in building into the experience in years to come. Gotcha. And, and Dr. Martin, what was the what was the expectation um, for an adult level performance? I mean, what you know, wh- when you originally envisioned what you wanted them to do in your office, was that just that you immediately knew it or you just scaled up to it? Like, how did that process start? Well, I think one of the things that that I started out making them do early on was to present patients to me. So one of the things that we were asking of our technicians was not to just hand a chart to me, but I expected Joshua and Ashley and all of our technicians to be able to hand me a chart and go, 
65-year-old Caucasian female, early macular degeneration, epiretinal membrane in the left eye, early cataracts, vision's a little funky, I may, maybe she may need a change in prescription. I expected them to be able to go in the room, do all the things that they're supposed to do, and summarize it in an intelligent fashion. You know, that's, that's high level stuff for a high school student. And I think the really fascinating thing about work-based learning students or co-op students, especially if you pick them properly, is if you treat them like an adult, lo and behold, they act like adults. So I remember Josh would be like, after a while, he would just come in, just bang, 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 bang. Here's your patient, here's what's going on. I mean, the ability to see it, summarize it, present it, understand it. And then that I think is very transferable to the medical career. It's also transferable almost to any other job that you have to be able to go in, look at something, synthesize and present that information. You know, that applies to any of the STEM things, but I think it applies particularly within the bounds of um, myopia management and within the bounds of specialty care. Yeah, and it, I imagine you need an, a higher level of education in this case than an average team member. Uh, Joshua, can you speak to that? What kind of education did you get coming into uh, this position? Just one of the biggest things was working with patients. I've never worked with people. And once again, you said I was very shy. So that was a big education, just knowing how to work with people and how to talk to people. I know it sounds easy, but it's definitely a sometimes a learned skill. But even just finding ways to move the exam along, filling out paperwork, even like things as simple as visual acuities. We ran VEP, ERGs, like just slowly build up and build up and build up. And it became so handy in grad school where there was just one less thing you had to learn because it was second nature because you knew it. And I feel like you definitely had a leg up compared to everyone else. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I hear all the time about how, you know, we're becoming more distant from each other with technology, with automation hitting the workforce in the way that it is and projections on what that looks like. And it, it seems like the future is going to be involved in having social skills and being able to identify with other people. And so I, I love that you said that because I feel like that's an important component of any practice is the staff being able to relate to the uh, to the patients because they see them in a different way than the doctor does, right? And Ashley, would you agree with that? And what kind of education do you think that you received uh, higher than what the average team member would have gotten? Absolutely. Um, so being in school right now is a little bit different experience because um, a lot of my classmates are somewhat fresh to eye care. Um, so whereas, you know, this during my second year of grad school, I've now been in the eye care industry, I guess you could say for six or seven years, and I'm, you know, young 20s. So it's a really valuable experience to be able to just have um, when you're talking with your professors or you're talking with other doctors or other future doctors, my classmates, it's helpful to be able to pull things from um, real life experiences rather than having to pull them from what you read out of a textbook. So it's valuable to be able to link different cases from your memory um, and make connections as far as, you know, things you're learning and building on the previous experiences that you've already had. Gotcha. And and Beth, I want to, oh, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, just to interject here, one of the things I find fascinating, and, and our, our system has uh, evolved a little bit over the years, but when we're ordering um, Ortho-K retainers, we, we do a lot of Ortho-K in our office. So like yesterday, I placed six orders for retainers for patients, right? That's not an, un, that's a little bit heavier than usual, but typically I'm placing orders every day, two or three sets of, of retainers, replacements, new fits, so forth. My co-op technicians, my work-based learning students are handling that. You know, they're handling when they come in. Did they get checked in? Was there a follow-up? When is the follow-up? But is a one week, two week, one month follow-up? Is it just duplicates? I don't have to see the patient. Is it a situation where I need to see the patient and take video? So it needs to go into exam lane one where our video slit lamp is. Um, you know, they're doing topographies. My, my technician will come in or my, you know, my co-op, my work-based learning technician will come in and I'll say, how do the topographies look? He's like, oh, they look well-centered and I've got, looks like a nice treatment zone. I mean, the fact that I've got students, high school students doing that level of uh, myopia control, that level of ortho-K topography interpretation um, would blow the minds of some of my colleagues. But 
these students are ready for that level if you just give them the opportunity to experience that. And then Beth will have a chance to talk a little bit about, you know, how ready those students are. Yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to go with this uh, next, and then we'll pop back over to uh, Ashley and Joshua. Beth, when I was in high school, like I rolled my eyes at every job I had. I was working fast food. I worked at a sandwich shop. And I like my parents imparted on me that I should be a hard worker, and I did the best job I could, but I wasn't like super into it beyond that. Are Ashley and Joshua just exceptional people, or is there something you're specifically looking for? How do you get into the recruitment process uh, involved in this whole program? Yeah, so we do offer, you know, we, we let students know about this opportunity and then the students come to us. At that point, I'll try to, you know, ask about some career interests and we'll go through there. We'll look at some, what classes they've really enjoyed. So that's kind of my job trying to figure out where they might be a good fit, um, looking at attendance records, looking at their involvement in clubs and activities at school. But honestly, the things that um, Dr. Rabideau and Ashley are saying all goes back to what Dr. Martin said in just giving them those responsibilities because I have had students that you would think they are just top notch students. And I might place them at a corporation that that will have them pushing papers and filing and go get the mail and things like that. And honestly, if you take a risk to give these students responsibilities, it, it's going to be difficult at first. <laughs> it's going to take a little bit of training, but but it will be so impactful and you will see them soar. So there will be students where I think to myself, oh, I'm not sure if they're cut out for this job. And then after their placement in a few weeks with some really great training, they just blow you away. It, it's insane. So really if the employers um, are willing to, to give some really serious job responsibilities, uh, you know, that they normally might not offer a 17 year old student, I think that you'll see success. And Matthew Martin is kind of, I mean, he's, he, a lot of the doctors in our academy are, are like Matthew. They're, they're big personalities, lots of energy, very passionate. Um, and you can just, you can get that great vibe off of them. And so that must be great to have that as kind of like a template for where to send, you know, the right kind of people. But, you know, for the average optometrist or one of our other members, like what should, what should they be looking for specifically in that, you know, in a potential recruit? Well, when we, I think that Dr. Abidu talked about it briefly, you know, that, that patient experience, you do want a student that, that has some strong communication skills. I call a lot of people in the career world, will call them soft skills. I call them essential skills because they are essential. And it is where teenagers are lacking right now. We're living in a rough world after the pandemic and they are lacking so many essential soft skills. So, you know, you might want to look for a student that has some strong communication skills or even in an interview can explain answers or give examples, um, those types of things. And Dr. Martin has interviewed several students. <laughs> and so uh, he, he kind of can see, but I do look at, I'll look at their grade point average, not I don't think that that is everything. I'll look at their involvement. I'll, I'll look at, um, usually I do try to find students that are somewhat interested in healthcare because I know that at Dr. Martin's office, they do get that patient experience. I did not truly understand that until I went in as a patient and one of my co-op students, my work-based learning student was the technician. And she took me into the, into the first room and, you know, started all the, the questions in the interview and I'm like this is amazing I can't believe that he has you do all of these things I really did not truly understand it until I was in as a patient so uh, yeah in, in as an employer feel free to say you know I'm looking for a student that has these qualifications and then that does help the coordinator I have companies that will ask for a certain GPA they'll they'll ask for to look at attendance records that's a huge thing because you are going to invest time and money into hiring the student. So you want to make sure, you know, that at least the candidates that you're getting are, are going to be, you know, reliable in terms of attendance. And that's that should be one of the coordinator's jobs as well. That's what I do. I help with setting up interviews and screening candidates. And I try to send him a good, a good chunk of students. And then from there, Dr. Martin just takes it away.
This podcast is made possible by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. If you want to learn how to do ortho K, then we can teach you. If you're looking for a passionate community of like-minded experts, then consider becoming an AAOMC member. Or if myopia management just isn't your thing, that's okay too. Use the AAOMC online doctor search tool to refer your myopia management patients. For more information, visit aaomc.org and join us. Join the war against the myopia epidemic. That's awesome. I'd like to um, toss this back over to uh, Joshua and Ashley, uh, because if I remember correctly, Dr. Martin had mentioned that he has y'all do projects. I was wondering if you guys could go into that. And I think I remember him mentioning this years ago at a, in a, at a, meeting that we were both at. I'm not going to let him describe it at all. Uh, Ashley, why don't you tell us about it? Because I don't want I don't want him to uh, set this up. Ashley, what kind of projects does he have you guys do? Yeah, so basically anything that will help you learn. Um, so that was part of uh, expanding the role of the co-op program, I guess, as well, is making those projects a little bit more structured. So things changed even from when Joshua was there to when I was there um, to now when the co-op students that are there now. Um, as far as the projects goes, they're a little bit more regular and there's certain topics that uh, Dr. Martin has you pick from. So some of them are eye care related, some of them are general health care related, some of them are free choice, so you can do a project on anything you want. Um, one of the projects that I did actually is still hanging in the office, I believe. I did a painting. Um, I'm pretty artsy fartsy. So I painted uh, some images of like the digital imaging, retinal imaging, um, different ocular diseases, what they look like. Um, so I did like diabetes, oh, healthy retina and macular degeneration. So I did crafty stuff like that. I made models of how antibiotics worked, um, like out of pipe cleaners and stamps and all kinds of fun stuff. So a lot of like hands-on, but some of the co-ops will take a different direction and do PowerPoint slides and just simply look up information and present it. So it can, it's really gives the students an opportunity to learn in the way that works best for them about a topic of their choice that's gonna make sure that they're a, learning something and be interested enough to do the research on their own without somebody holding their hand. Um, and it's just an extra benefit to working at the office is that you get not only the, the learning that you get on a day-to-day -day basis with patient care, but you also get to learn about different topics that interest you related to eye care and otherwise. Okay. And did any of these topics ever have to do with um, ortho case specifically or myopia control specifically or? Really just depends on what the what the uh, student picks to to do. Um, I didn't do any ortho K projects specifically, um, but I that was because I was getting the best experience I could have learning ortho K from Dr. Martin and and handling it with patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the projects are more of like a extra above and beyond, something different than what we see every day. Sometimes it will be, a, um, we see an interesting case of a patient in the office with a certain ocular disease and Dr. Martin says, okay, go home, research, write a page and bring it to me next week, tell me what you learned. Or, you know, we see something like that and the co-op student will, take that and turn it into their project for the month. Um, so it really just really just depends on what piques their interest and kind of the cases we see in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. Gotcha. And uh, Josh, what kind of projects did you do for uh, Dr. Martin? I did some eye-related ones, but he just said, do a couple of eye-related and then whatever. I remember doing a leprosy one, just because why not? Then like elephantitis, some random just disease because I thought it would be fun to research. I think he didn't care what you did as long as you wanted to learn. And then you just force you to learn. And it was fun, right? Learning about elephantitis or whatever it was. And then you had to learn it because he would ask you questions about it. Just random questions. But I got so good at random diseases. That was just another thing when in grad school, granted, I never had to learn about that. But like macular degeneration, any of those things, like you just got very good at it. It also got you good at presenting because so many times in school, doctors like, go home and research this disease. Let me know about it tomorrow. Or, classes they make you present on a case 
I know I have to do a couple here soon. Like, it's just good experience to have. And Dr. Martin's great about it because he's very nice when you get something wrong. The docs and similar presentations are not, right? So it's a very good open experience to learn. And does he make you does he make you get up in bunch in front of a bunch of people or is there like an auditorium effect like how does this work? Giant. It was uh, one of those stadiums. No, it was <laughs> just him and us in the office. I don't. I think now he's recording them sometimes and posting them, but I think that's now newer versus when I was there. Gotcha. Yeah, I know he's doing Facebook Lives every once in a while as well, nice. where our co-ops will present uh, on Facebook Live, so people can join in live or watch it later. That's awesome. And Dr. Martin, um, I don't know if this is my memory or not, but did you the way that I think you originally told me about this years ago is you mentioned that you had a student do a presentation on toxic plasmosa. Is that true? Tell me about that. Yeah, we've had some really great ones over the years. I have had um, I've had students do things like how deep can you dive and still stay oxygenated? I've had students I had a student do a whole thing on London taxi cab drivers and how they have a portion of their brain that is advanced beyond everybody else's. Um, I have had some just crazy stuff. Obviously, we expect them to do some eye related stuff, but they also have the opportunity to do things like, you know, talk about MS or talk about autism or all these different types of things. And now we record those and we will often play those in our reception area. So we have a reception area. In our reception area, we have, um, I'm a firm believer, and this is a practice management thing for other doctors out there. Whenever I walk into another eye doctor's office and I see a TV playing local television, I wanna pull my hair out. Because if you've got patients waiting in your reception area, which we hope they don't wait very long, but if you have patients waiting in your reception area, you should absolutely be giving them the programming that you want them to see, right? It should be talking about myopia control, talking about ortho K, talking about atropine, talking about peripherally focused contact lenses. You know, your, your stuff out in the, in the reception area should be talking about that, but then people get bored. If all you do is present um, programming, people will stop paying attention to it. So what we do is I have my co-ops record their presentation. So I make them give a PowerPoint and I teach them how to make a good PowerPoint because we've all gone to lectures where the PowerPoints were terrible. So, um, and Ashley Peters, interestingly enough, actually helped me develop my PowerPoint game. Compliments to Ashley Peters. So lots of pictures, not a ton of words, a good explanation, and I make them record it. And so you see them go from this very awkward, I can't believe I'm in front of a camera, to oftentimes by the end of the term, they're like, blah, 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 doing their thing in front of the camera. And then we put those in the reception area. So let's say that you're a patient and you're sitting there and you just watched a little thing on myopia control or whatever, or you just saw a thing on anti-reflective coatings. You might watch a, a, a two minute uh, talk from a student on um, leprosy, or you might see a two minute talk from a student on taxi cab drivers in London, or you might see someone talking about why this particular star system is different than another one. So the fact that they have some medical stuff they have to do, but the free choice stuff I think is really a really neat thing for them because the stuff they come up with, and I could send you a list, it's crazy. The stuff they do is like, I'm like what? Whatever possessed you to think, I, all right, I'll learn about it, you know? So, um, but it's really great what they come up with. It then yeah, also send... gives the, uh, the technician a really great opportunity to talk to the patient and um, develop those like communication skills because the patient will say, oh, I saw your presentation on so-and-so or whatever in the waiting room. And that's really cool. Can you tell me more about what you learned? Or, um, you know, gives the gives the technician then an opportunity to be like a real human and converse with the patient and not just be a technician robot going through the questions before an exam. Yeah, I got to imagine that that makes the experience the overall practice experience like the patient is is paying attention to these lectures or they're in the background or whatever and it's like this is a different experience than your average optometrist right so like the person who's giving that lecture is somebody who is helping you in the office and it, it seems like it adds an extra special layer of attention and and personality to the practice uh for sure so oh, go ahead matt yeah and so and while we're talking about doing these presentations and, and presenting them, let's talk about the fact that as a doctor in a specialty practice, so the idea behind this whole 
podcast was, why should doctors who are in myopia control or the academy, why should they care about work-based learning? I run into a lot of doctors when I lecture and they're like, well, I don't have a social media presence or I fooled around with Facebook, but it was just too much work or um, my staff all says Instagram's great, but I don't wanna take the time to do Instagram. When you hire a work-based learning student, you're hiring someone who's probably social media savvy. So what we have in our office is when they're, since they're gonna be making a, uh, a video of their lecture, it goes on Facebook. You know, sometimes they'll tweet it on their personal account. Sometimes I like to send it to Beth Jahosky and hope she'll put it on the work-based learning thing for the whole community, right? There's no reason it shouldn't be hitting all of those social places. And you can actually assign your students, your co-op students, your, your work-based learning students to do that for you. I don't wanna do that, I don't have time, I'm not talented, but they are. They can post that stuff, right? Um, my uh, work-based learning student right now, we had a five o'clock opening today um, and we didn't have a patient. So we posted it at two o'clock, unbeknownst to me, went on Facebook. Oh, we got an opening at five o'clock, we filled it. I wouldn't have taken the time to do that, but my student, social media savvy, posted it on Facebook, figured my patients would be seeing it, we filled the slot. There's no reason that, they, that doctors shouldn't be taking advantage, again, of this very talented group of employees who want the office to succeed and want to be excited about your office. Yeah, I, I remember I, when I go onto Facebook, it's only for work. I only use Facebook for work and use it sparingly. But every time I log in, I see a post from Matthew Martin's uh, practice and there's always a uh, appointment, you know, appointment just freed up and contact us now. And I, I, I'm always like, that guy's got it. I'm like, how did he figure that out? That's a great idea. So I'm glad to hear that it came from this homegrown process of having somebody there to do that for you. Um, you mentioned the, that that's a skill that a student can bring to the practice. And um, Beth, what can an office expect as far as those kinds of skills from the average student in this situation? Is this, is this just an exclusive experience or, or update us on what they can expect? Well, it varies, honestly. And really, my hope is that if they have certain expectation and skills and qualifications that they do let me know ahead of time so I don't send them a candidate that is not qualified for what they're looking for. Um, but honestly, most teenagers are social media savvy. It's just the way that they live. So that just comes with the package. But most of them will, will, I ask them to bring, you know, what are some of your strengths to the interview? And I'm just going to kind of backtrack on a few things that I've been talk, talking about too. I hope that's okay. But back to the projects, I, again, I'm blown away when I see those, but I love how Dr. Martin just lets those students kind of foster that love of learning, you know, cause he could very simply say, you know, find a project, something that has to do with eye care, but he does sometimes let them have that free range where it's like, whatever you choose to learn about, just do that. And how often do any of us at any age are we given that choice, except for maybe, you know, kindergarten or first grade? Whatever you want to learn about, just go learn. <laughs> so I love that he fosters that love of learning for the students. But, uh, you know, there are so many students that being placed in an employer helps them open their eyes to this is not at all what I thought it was or wow this is something I really want to do and I have the student that Dr. Martin is referring to just recently when he started he had no interest in optometry or you know anything to do with that but he was thinking along the healthcare lines and I knew he was a top-notch student so I sent him there and now he wants to follow directly in Dr. Martin's footsteps and he and I think it is giving them that experience, letting them see what is an, an eye care office all about, what is a clinic all about, because many students, uh, unless they're a patient, and who knows what their patient experience was like, they have they don't really have a clue as to what goes into running an um, optical office. So really giving them that experience is probably the best thing that you can do. And you you know, some of them are gonna realize this isn't my thing. And some of them are gonna say, this is amazing and this is what I wanna do. And either way, you are benefiting society, you're benefiting the community. And oftentimes it leads to retention. I don't know if Dr. Martin knows offhand how many students he's kept on. And I know you cannot keep them all on. He just can't do that. But I'm wondering if he has a number in his head. 
Yeah, that's the problem. The problem is you fall in love with a Joshua or you fall in love with an Ashley or you fall in love with a Max. The, these people come and they bring so much to us. It's hard to let them go. Like at the end of their year, it's a very difficult process. We were fortunate enough. We kept Joshua on for a few years while he worked on his undergraduate. And the same thing we were blessed with with Ashley Peters. Um, but if we've had just so many students, not only who've stayed on as patients in our office, but who've stayed on um, with their relationships. So we're coming up on a baseball game um, in August that I hope that we have every year at the local um, AAA um, baseball thing. And I always send out invitations to all of our co-ops who might be interested. And sometimes we'll have four, five, six, seven former staff members come to this who maybe haven't been there in years. You know, um, a couple of years ago, one of our staff members happened to be by from Chicago and they're like, well, I'm gonna stop by, you know, I mean, those opportunities are just are golden. And I want to touch base on something that, that, that Beth said, and that is if a doctor out there in a specialty practice brings on one of these students and let's say the student decides they don't want to go into eye care because we've had. So we've got one, two, three, four. We're going to end up with probably four or five students who are going to end up doctors or who want to be eye doctors who've come through our program or come through our our work-based learning we've also had students who came in and said nope no interest okay maybe i want to be a nurse maybe i want to be a veterinarian so we've got nurses veterinarians nurse practitioners future nurse practitioners um social workers you know phd social workers engineers if you're doing nothing else those students in other medical professions now are going to look at eye care differently. So many people outside of eye care don't realize all that we do and don't realize the passion that eye doctors have. OK, so every nurse that thinks that eye doctors are great is a win for us. OK, every veterinarian who's like, man, eye doctors are great. That is a win for optometry. That is a win for, for eye care, right? So even if, the, even if the student comes and they learn and they do the best they can in the position, but then afterwards they're like, nah, I'm gonna be your chiropractor. That's cool. But your chiropractor is gonna be like, mm, you know, when's the last time you had an eye exam? Maybe you should go see your eye doctor, you know, or your nurse practitioner is gonna be like, oh, you're diabetic. I could send you to the MD, but I'm gonna send you to the OD instead because I've worked in an OD office. And I know that they can do the diabetic eye exam as, as well, if not better than anybody. So, I mean, it, it just, it's it's good for eye care as well as it is good for your individual practice and your specialty care practice. Yeah, I, I love that you said that too, because I think the other part of it, and, and you could speak to this better than anyone, uh, is that, you know, just getting the word out about ortho care or myopia management in general, if you have somebody who's worked in your practice in that capacity, and they understand it and can communicate to other people the benefits of it. I mean, I still talk to people today, I describe ortho okay to them and they're like, this sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. So just being able to spread the good word about what myopia management is and, and you know, what it can offer the patient. So uh, I love I, that you said that. And I definitely think that's true. And what I do find interesting is that uh, uh, work-based learning students who leave our office are just like, man, it's ortho okay. <laughs> you know, like anywhere else it would be this magic. And they're like, man, it's just something we do every day. We see them, we run a topography on them, Dr. Martin changes the retainers or not, and that's it. It's 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 very, it's very uh straightforward for them. And their awareness of it within the bounds of specialty care is it's great. It's great that they that they have that knowledge and that they know it's just a routine thing within the bounds of our office. And so when they go somewhere else, they're like, well, why don't, why aren't you doing this in your office? And other doctors are like, well, maybe I should, you know, because it's, it's a routine thing for them because they see it all the time here. And Joshua, you were the myopia coordinator for Dr. Martin's practice. Is that correct? Can you, like, that, that's a rule that comes up often on this podcast is some optometrists have a staff member like that. Some don't. Um, you know, what kind of responsibility is that? And, and should every practice have a dedicated myopia control coordinator? I think it's a great idea. It definitely put a lot of responsibility on you, but we talked about giving them adult-like activities and they will do it. So part of my job was going to doctor's office in the area and making friends, greeting them saying, hey, you know, Dr. Martin, you know, it's an optometrist in the area. He wants to meet with you, talk about ortho K, but like building those relationships 
that's huge. Going into a doctor's office, introducing yourself as a professional, trying to make those connections, that's it was very intimidating, but you step up to the role and it's a great experience. Sorry, there is mosquitoes all over in here. Thank you guys for putting up with that. But uh, I was a myopia control coordinator. And it was just big. You were in charge of keeping track, making sure the retainers came back in time when they were supposed to. If they ordered a week ago and they're not here, you have to be in charge of watching out for it, just being an adult, like having a responsibility versus, you know, at the end of the day, you're done. You have to think about an entire thing for the rest of the day. It's it's big. It puts a lot of responsibility on you, but it's good responsibility because you're going to need it eventually. And I think it definitely made you a better doctor having that background. And and Ashley, um, <laughs> you can you can speak to this as well. Uh, but like having that kind of knowledge going into school, going into the next level of your education, like how did that help you? Uh, and where you're at in your education, I guess I should say. So. I am just starting my second year, like Dr. Martin said, and I think that it's really helpful to have a foundation in something that's cutting edge, not, you know, some newer technology, something that's not glasses contacts, like optometrists have been doing forever and ever. So I'm learning my basic skills to become an optometrist, but I also have a really important foundation in something that's going to be really big in my career in the next, you know, 20, 30 years of optometry, it's going to become uh, much more important. Myopia management is is going to be huge. So having that background before I've even started graduate school to become a doctor is is unparalleled. It's, uh, you know, something that I won't learn in the classroom and something that's going to be extremely helpful to have when I am looking for a job that I already have experience in uh, a newer technology like, like ortho -K. Yeah, I, when I talk to students, or at least uh, pre-COVID, when I talk to students at conventions or whatnot, uh, conferences, and uh, I'd be like, this is something you should definitely learn more about because it increases your overall potential value, you know, going into finding employment at a, joining another practice or starting your own practice. It gives, if you're joining another practice, it gives you a uh, potential new revenue stream that that practice may not have had before. It, it sets you up as an expert and gives you an advantage, I, I, in my opinion, over, you know, the average uh, student in, or, you know, new doctor in that same position. Um, go ahead. Absolutely. And uh, so far throughout first year, we didn't get a whole lot of uh, education, if none at all, on ortho -K and myopia control because we're just trying to learn the basics right now. Right. So it's a lot to try and figure out eyes from the start and then throw in this new and upcoming thing that, you know, some offices do, some offices don't. So I, for one, having a foundation in it have been able to get my classmates excited who are future ODs as well that either have never worked in an office that did orthokeratology, have never heard of orthokeratology, that might be interested in providing that for their patients one day. Um, so, you know, for me, it's great to get the word out even before I'm a doctor because building that network is important now as a student, even as a young professional. So. it's awesome. Um, Matthew, is there anything else that you wanted us to cover before I want to close it out with Beth and and try to cover like how we can get the word out about this and how any optometrist who's viewing or listening to this podcast can find a, a similar program in their area? So is there anything else we should cover before I let Beth close us out? Nope. I think I just was I'm hoping that Beth can very um, take it down to a simple level. What should a doctor Google if they are looking for you in their area. So let's say I'm a doctor in Phoenix and it's 115 degrees outside and I, I decide I want a work-based learning student. What do I Google in Phoenix? You know, that's that's what I'm after. I want other doctors to be able to be like, how do I get one of these incredible opportunities? Honestly, if you reach out to your local schools and even just a phone call and say, can I speak with a work-based learning coordinator? I can guarantee that you're probably going to be placed with someone at the school. Uh, but Googling, you know, you could look at, again, you know, whatever public school it is and work-based learning opportunities or something like that. Um, career and like CTE, career and technical educational sites like that. You know, we do have a career center where many of our students as juniors, they might have gone into the nursing or the healthcare program and 
I would pull a lot of those students out and then ask them, hey, would you be interested in working at, at an eye care facility or, you know, with Dr. Martin down the road as most of our students know him because he's with, literally within a half mile of our high school. And so I would pull those students. So a lot of times if you reach out to the career and technical education centers, they also pair up with work-based learning. So they might also be able to help you with placements, but it's truly simple, probably simpler than most, most doctors think. That's awesome. All right. Um, okay. So since we've covered everything uh, in this episode, I want to take this time to go around uh, the for each guest. And if you want to uh, let us know how people can reach you or find more information about you on the internet, we'll start with Dr. Matthew Martin. Dr. Martin, if people are interested, uh, where can they find information about you on the internet? Yeah, so I'm fairly accessible. Um, I own Auburn Optical in Auburn, Michigan, which is pretty easy to remember. So you could start out just by Googling our website. You could also reach me at auburnoptical at gmail.com. Certainly you can jump onto Facebook and friend me. I'll jump right back and uh, we can have communication that way. Um, or if you really want to talk to me on the phone, you can reach out at 989-662-2501. You'll get to listen to Ashley Peters' voice on our answering machine. That's awesome. Ashley, where can people find more information about you on the net? I'm not too hot on the Google yet. However, uh, my Instagram is Ash L. Peters. And if you want to send me a direct email, you can find me at ashleypeters16 at gmail.com. Awesome. Joshua, online, where can people find more information about you? Um, probably the best way would be to email me. It's not an easy email, but it's J-S-R-A-B-I-D-E at S-V-S-U dot E-D-U. It would probably be the best way. Um, once again, not too big on Google, but I am a resident at the Battle Creek VA. So if you want to stop out and say hi, uh, I'll be here. All right. And Beth, same. If anyone wants to find more information about you or the, the programs you're involved in, uh, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, feel free to reach out. Even if, you know, wherever you live, I can try to help pair you up with the coordinator in your area. I'm more than happy to do the searching for you. So feel free to reach out. I am the work-based learning coordinator for the Bay City Public Schools, specifically Western High School. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Beth Jahoski. You can find me at email, which is Jahoski B boy at bcschools.net uh, and Jahoski is with a G. So we might need to spell this out. I'm going to spell it G E H O S K I B at bcschools.net. Great. And I'll get, uh, I'll, I'll hit you all up for this information and then put it in the show notes, uh, you know, for anybody who uh, needs, you know, just to have it in front of them visually. And I want to thank you guys for, you know, being on this episode of The Corrected View. Uh, this is uh, an effort by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, uh, whose members pay annual dues, their actual real life money to bring you content like this. And uh, if you are interested in what we're all about, um, you know, you can become a member. We have a base member program, which is free, which is perfect for students, by the way. So if you're an optometry student out there and you're interested in seeing what we're all about, connecting with, uh, you know, people like Dr. Matthew Martin online, uh, aaomc.org is uh, the best way to get in touch with us. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other episodes we've done, the corrected view at gmail.com is our email address. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me on this podcast. Matthew Martin, I think this was a great uh, topic. If you consider this an open invite uh, from this point forward, if you have any other topics you want to discuss, uh, bring them my way. We'll, we'll put them up for sure. You can count on that. I've got all kinds of ideas. We'll have a good time. All right. Thanks everyone. And uh, for the audience, we'll see you at the next one. Well, that's it for this episode of The Corrected View. And if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to thank the standard members of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, whose annual dues and support make it possible for the AAOMC to put out education, awareness, and content like this. And I'd also like to give a special shout out that I'm going to be giving out at the end of every Corrected View episode for one full year. And that shout out goes to Dr. Somi O oh for her very generous contribution at the lifetime member level of our fundraiser. Thank you to everyone who contributed. 
and keeping the AAOMC alive. You are awesome.